Hey, here's what I know. Not all of us grew up going to church as kids, but if you did, you probably remember Sunday school. When I was a little kid, I was fortunate enough to grow up in the church and we'd attend Sunday school. And here's what I remember. Sunday school would always start with this large woman, Mrs. Lindy, leading us in music. And when she would sing and she would laugh, her entire body would shake. (laughs) But she would teach us those songs, songs like, you know, those songs that sort of stick in our head. They stay there all our life, like this one, sing with me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. You remember that song, right? Uh, If you grew up going to church, you probably also remember this one. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. There's one more I was thinking about this week, and it goes like this. Put your hands out. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 Remember that one? Well, that one had me thinking this week, and I actually did a little bit of research on that song, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. A couple of things you should know about that song. First off, in 1958, get this, that was the number one song on the pop top 100 billboard charts. It was the top song in America. It was number three on the R&B billboard chart, and it was the second most sold album in America. Now, think about that today. That would be like us today teaching our Sunday school kids Taylor Swift songs, huh? It seems that modern music had an impact on the church even way back when. But here's the second thing. This is more important for today. Here's what I learned about that song. That song is an African-American spiritual. We don't know who wrote it, but we know that he likely came up with the tune and the words while working in the fields in the deep south. We know, as a slave, that he experienced some things that you and I can't even imagine. I mean, on a daily basis, he could be beaten, he could be sold, he could have even been put to death, and his owner would have felt no repercussion for it. He had no way to take care of his family. Uh, He had no control over his past, his present, or his future. Every day, he was forced to work in the scorching hot sun of of the deep south. And yet, contrary to everything he experienced, he was able to point to God and sing that song. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 Folks, you and I, we've never experienced slavery, obviously. But here's what I know. You and I, we know what it's like to be at the end of our rope. We began this series, At the End of My Rope, a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about how in America there's something going on. Get this statistic. 55% of Americans report feeling stressed out at at the end of their rope on a daily basis. Now, this should concern us, people, because get this, the global average is just 35%. We are the most stressed out nation on the planet. And if you're raising kids, this should be especially concerning to you because get this, contrary to popular belief, as this chart shows, the younger you are, the more stressed out you are. We are raising the most stressed out generation to ever walk this planet. I mean, our lives are stressful today. I mean, if you have a job, if you're in the workforce, you know this, uh, that we uh, have fewer workers than ever before. Uh, And so maybe like this meme I'm going to show you, you you feel like this. You're on the phone at work. You say, please hold. I suddenly have to go bang my head against the wall. You've been there, huh? At the end of your rope. If you're a parent, maybe you felt like this mom here. I often worry about the safety of my children, especially the one that is rolling their eyes at me and talking back right now. 
Or maybe you're in that generation where you're raising your parents. Uh, maybe you're a kid raising your parents, or maybe uh, you're someone raising elderly parents. Uh, maybe, uh, well, I like what Yoda says, raising parents, may the force be with you. It's stressful. Or maybe you're in the later stage of life and your body isn't keeping up with your mind. Uh, you feel every once in a while like you're losing it. Uh, I like how this meme puts it, going to bed early, not leaving my house, not going to a party, my childhood, childhood punishments have become my adult goals. Here's the other thing. Uh, here in Minnesota, uh, football season is about to start, and if you're a Vikings fan, let's just be honest, it's stressful. We find ourselves at the end of our rope every season. Uh, I hate this meme, but Dad, what's a Super Bowl ring? I don't know, son. We're Vikings fans. It's stressful being a Vikings fan. In all seriousness, here's, here's the truth. You and I, we know what it's like to be at the end of our rope. And so over the last few weeks, we've been asking this question. It's a simple one, but one you and I, we all ask from time to time. The question is this, where... Do you find hope when you're at the end of your rope? Because all of us have been there. And so a few weeks ago, we kicked off the series by, by remembering that, that hope is a choice. Uh, again and again in the Bible, the Bible speaks of how hope is something that God wants to give to us, but it is a, a choice. Uh, we looked at the Psalms, and the Psalms said things like this, I put all my hope in the Lord. He leaned down to me. He listened to my cry for help. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the muck. He set my feet on rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth. The psalm reminds us that we get to choose hope. Hope is a choice. Well, then the last couple of weeks of this series, we've been looking at a great story. It's the story, the story of Elijah. Elijah was one of the greatest prophets. If you haven't read his story before, go to 1 Kings chapters 17, 18, and 19. You've got to read it. Elijah was one of the strongest, boldest uh, prophets that ever lived. But God, for whatever reason, uh, just to recap the story, sent Elijah out into the wilderness. He was out there for three years. There was a drought. Life was a drag out in the wilderness. He had nothing to eat. Uh, birds would feed him. I don't know why. It's a strange story. Uh, but here's the deal. God sent him to a widow. And this widow when he finally came face to face with her, he found out she was a poverty-stricken woman. She didn't even have enough to feed herself and her kid. And so being a prophet of God, uh, somehow, some way, he gave her a jar. And, and this jar would provide all the food somehow that she would ever need. Uh, uh, while he was doing this, this woman's son died, and this woman accused him of killing her son. And so being a prophet of God, again, he raised this son from the dead. Well, God would then send him, if that wasn't enough, to the evil king Ahab. And one thing led to another, and evil king Ahab sent 850 false prophets after Elijah. And Elijah would have to stand them all down. You see, here's the thing. Elijah was at the end of his rope. He knew what it was like to be stressed out, strung out, overwhelmed. And if all that wasn't enough, all of a sudden, King Ahab's wife comes on the scene. And let me tell you, this woman by the name of Jezebel, she was bonkers. She was nuts. The story goes like this. Ahab told his wife Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And that's when we hear what Jezebel does. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, she said, in effect, well, if my husband can't take care of you, Elijah, I'll take matters into my own hands. She says, may the gods punish me terribly if by this time tomorrow I don't kill you just as you killed those prophets. This woman was nuts and she was going after Elijah. Well, Elijah, by this time, he had had enough. He was, he was up to here. He was at the end of his rope. And so what does Elijah do? The story says, when Elijah heard this, he was afraid and he ran for his life. He walked for a whole day into the desert. He sat down under a bush and asked to die. I have had enough, Lord, he prayed. Let me die. 
Folks, you've been at the end of your rope. I mean, moms, you've had that moment where you've said, if I have to change one more dirty diaper, I'm going postal on my family. Huh? Uh, or at work. Huh? Y y there's that guy. You just want to strangle him. If you're later in life, you're dealing with health concerns. I if I have to deal with insurance one more time, I have had it. <laughs> you've been there. You know what it's like to feel what Elijah felt. Or maybe you're a mom. You, you came home one day, you made this healthy, nutritious meal, and your son sat down and said, what is that? And that's when the Jezebel inside of you came out, right? You remember this. If by tomorrow things don't change, you said to your family, someone's going to die. You see, Elijah was at the end of his rope, and you and I know what that's like. Well, God doesn't ever leave us there. And God didn't leave Elijah there. And the story goes on. It says, all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a, wa a, a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. You see, here's what we find out from this story, that not only is hope a choice, but we have a God who didn't design us, didn't create us to live at the end of our rope 24-7. This God says to us, hey, you got to eat, you got to rest, you got to repeat. You got to find these healthy rims. I didn't create you to live going 150 miles an hour each and every day. Well, the story goes on and it says this. Elijah then cried out to God. He said, I have always served you as well as I could. I've done everything you've ever asked. But the people of Israel, they've broken their agreement with you, destroyed your altars, and killed your prophets with swords. I, listen to this, Elijah tells himself a lie. I am the only one left. He lies to himself. He says, I, I, I'm all alone. And isn't that what you and I do when we're at the end of our rope? We tell ourselves lies about ourselves. Uh, no one cares about me. I'm not good enough. I'm not a good enough husband, not a good enough coworker, not a good enough spouse. I, I, I'll never be able to get it all done. You see, the story reminds us, number three, that not only is hope a choice, not only does God uh, invite us to, to create healthy rhythms of eating, resting, and repeating, but God invites us to replace those lies we tell ourselves with God's love. You see, God created you. God knows every hair on your head. We have a God who created you, and this God doesn't make any junk. Replace those lies with God's love. Well, today, it's the, as the story closes, here's what happens. It says, The Lord said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for, listen to this, the Lord is about to pass by. I don't know about you, but when I'm at the end of my rope, when I'm strung out, overwhelmed, stressed out, here's what it feels like. It feels like, well, God, where are you? It feels sometimes like, uh, like God's abandoning me, like God's voice is somehow just so small, almost insignificant in those moments when I'm at the end of my rope. And so here's what happens. God says, Elijah, I'm going to make myself present for you. And I imagine Elijah got excited. Uh, God's going to show up in a big way. God is going to alter, God's going to change everything. And so the story goes on like this. It says, then a very strong wind blew until it caused the mountains to fall apart and large rocks to break. And I imagine Elijah went, this is it. God is here. But the story says this but the Lord was not in the wind. It goes on and it says this, after the wind, there was an earthquake. And I imagine Elijah said, this is it. But the story goes on and says, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Again, the story goes on. It says, after the earthquake, there was fire. And I imagine Elijah said, this has got to be it. But it says, the Lord was not in the fire. But listen to this. Listen to where the story goes. It says, after the fire, there was a quiet, gentle whisper. Hmm? And God would appear to Elijah in that quiet whisper. God would 
talk to Elijah. You see, isn't that how it is? In those moments where, where we're just, we've had, God's voice seems so small, like a whisper. Why does God whisper? Here's the truth about God. Because God's so close. Why does God whisper? Because God is so close to you and to me. We know this. God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. We hear again and again, nothing will separate you from my love for you. We hear in the Psalms that God will be there in the valleys and on the mountaintops wherever we go. As Psalm 34 says this, it says the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Say this with me, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 139 says much of the same. It says, where can I go from your spirit? If I go up to the heavens, say it with me, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Your right hand will hold me fast. Even Paul in the book of Philippians, he says more of the same. He says this, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Say it with me, the Lord is near. Folks, when you and I are at the end of our road, when we're strung out, stressed out, overwhelmed, God's voice feels so small, like just a little whisper. Why does God whisper? Say it with me. Because God is so close. Would you do this for me? Would you turn to your neighbor, whoever you're sitting next to, and would you say to them, say this, this might feel creepy. Say that to them. Say it, say it. This might feel creepy. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to answer this question question in just a little whisper in their ear. Why does God whisper? I want you to say this with me. Because God is so close. Whisper it to them. Because God is so close. As we wrap up this worship series, here's the deal. We've been wondering, where do I find hope in those moments in my life when I am just at the end of my rope? We were reminded several weeks ago uh, that hope is a choice. You and I, we get to choose to believe that, uh, that with God, the future is better than whatever present circumstance we're experiencing. We have a God who didn't create us to be strung out, stressed out all our lives. A God who invites us to eat, to rest, and repeat, to learn rhythms of healthy living. Uh, when we are strung out, when we're at the end of our rope, we have this tendency to tell ourselves lies. And so God invites us to replace those lies with God's love. But finally, if you remember nothing else, nothing else from this series, would you remember this? When God feels distant in those moments, when God's voice seems just like a tiny little whisper, remember this, it's because God is so close. When I was a kid, my dad, he's always been a singer. He loved to sing. And so growing up in a Christian home, before bed, he would sit down next to my bed and we'd say our prayers together. Now I lay me down to sleep. And after we were done, he'd usually give me a little kiss on the forehead. And because my dad loved to sing, he would he'd sit there and sing me to sleep. And I remember uh, every once in a while, I would pretend to fall asleep while he was there because the more uh, I would fall asleep, I'd look like I was sleeping, the quieter his voice would get. And so some nights, he, he, I'd fall asleep to the whisper of him whispering that great old song. He's got the whole world in his hands he's got the whole world sing it with me in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands I'm pressed on every side I still know Subscribe.
Folks, as we close our time together, I want to invite you to join me in the words of the prayer our Lord taught us. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey folks, thanks so much for tuning in today, for joining us. Uh, if this is your first time with us, we're just honored you chose to spend a little bit of time with us. We'd love for you to head out to our website, take a little next step with us. We'd love to get connected with you. It's easy, just go out to our website, hit the button that says sign up for emails, and each Friday we'll send out a little note that shares all the ways you can get involved here at Calvary. Hey, next week is a big week for us here at the church. We transition to our fall schedule. If you're somebody who sometimes watches online and at other times joins us in person, we want to make sure you know uh, that this weekend is our final Calvary at the Lake service. And so next week we begin our fall schedule, which means we'll have two services back at the church each and every Sunday, uh, a traditional one at 8.30, a modern one at 10.30, we also will launch our Friday 
uh, excuse me, Wednesday night service, which is at 6.30, with all our student programming on Wednesday night. If you have a student in your house, we want to make sure you get them signed up. Bring them for that first Wednesday night so they can join a small group and get in, get involved. Hey folks, we're also doing something rig really big here at the church. I'm super excited about it. Uh, here's what I know. You and I, uh, far too often, we love the faith that we share. Uh, we love Jesus. Uh, we, we maybe have plaques on the walls in our homes that have Bible verses. You might even have a cross tattoo somewhere on your body. You might wear a WWJD bracelet. Somebody sneezes, you say, God bless you, right? We love our faith. But here's what I know. For far too many of us, uh, when it comes to the Bible, we feel a little uncomfortable with it. No one's ever showed us how to read it or, or, or made it easy to access. That's just what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks. We want to open to you the story of the Bible and make the story of Jesus far more accessible to you. So next week, we're starting a series. It, it's got kind of a plain name. It's called The Book of Mark. The Book of Mark is the shortest of the Gospels, the, sto the stories in the Bible that tell the life of Jesus. It, we're going to read through it together, and, and we're going to unpack the story. We're going to do it in three ways. First off, we've got a message series we're launching again next weekend. Uh, secondly, if, if you come to worship, we're going to give you uh, the book of Mark along with some notes that I've created. We published a little book that we want to give you. Uh, if you worship only online, you can use the QR code on the screen, and we'll send one to you. But thirdly, we're going to start an online devotion. Each and every night over the next few weeks, we're going to help you walk through the book of Mark. I'm really excited about it because here's what I know. Here's what I know. Following Jesus without feeling comfortable with the story of Jesus, it's a little awkward. And we all want to get comfortable with it. So, hey gang. Thanks so much for joining us. As we close today, uh, just a huge thank you for your generosity, for all the ways you support the work that God does through our church. As we close, you can make your offerings in any of the ways on the screen. Uh, the first and probably the easiest way is to head out to our website, hit the button that says give. You can sign up for a one-time or a reoccurring gift. The second way to give is use that app on your phone, Venmo. You can always write a check and send it to the address on the screen. Or if you're not quite sure how to make your gift or you want to make a special gift, we'd love for you to give us a call in the church office. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about all the ways that we live that generous life that God calls every last one of us to. Folks, thanks so much for tuning in. Have a great Labor Day weekend.